Historically, the human relation with the divine has left in its wake a profound and enduring paradox. Often, the mystical experience of the divine is one of radical eminence, in which the divine or the numinous is experienced so profoundly that the subject and object collapse, and what remains is an annihilation into something just absolutely beyond unity and plurality, perhaps beyond all concepts at all. The language here is often one of radical unity, erotic fusing, and divine presence, as the Quran reminds us that the divine is closer to us than our jugular vein. On the other hand, there is an equally powerful tradition of the intellection of the divine, primarily by philosophers and theologians, in which the divine relishes in absolute sovereignty, aloof and utterly transcendent beyond all experience, ability, in any sense, the serenity of the Deus Absconditus. Of course, both traditions, the experiential, phenomenological, along with the intellective, analytical traditions, can and often do fuse in the lives of single people and are by no means mutually exclusive. One of the greatest theologians and philosophers of all time, Thomas Aquinas, probed into those depths of intellection with more precision than I think most in history, and yet, after an experience of the divine, felt that everything that he had written, it was all just straw. The dialectic between the radically eminent and the radically transcendent of the divine is one of the most productive paradoxes in the history of mysticism, philosophy, and theology. And for the history of Western esotericism, one of the most inspiring means by which to frame this paradox has emerged from the world of Kabbalah and the system of divine emanations, or sferot, which flow from the inner regions of the unknowable, transcendent divine no-thingness, nothingness, to substantiate the world of all-thingness, populated with all that is and all that will be, imminent to every moment of experience. However, the origins of the system of the Sfirot remain extremely mysterious, and to better understand the philosophical foundations of this esoteric school of emanations, I want to explore a obscure theological development in which the very divine glory, the Kavod, was transformed into a singular archangel, as a fiery divine emanation, and the mysterious medieval group of mystics that centered their speculations on that Keruv HaMayuchad, the special or unique cherub, a theory of divine emanation predating and eventually helping to give rise to the Sfirot as we know them. But if you're interested in the history of magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, or like this episode, the Kabbalah, or just the history of the occult from an analytical, historically evidence-based and academic perspective, and I hope you to make sure to subscribe here and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics like this in the history of Western esotericism on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting my work over at my Patreon with a one-time donation via PayPal with the super thanks option down there below the video, or you can pick up some of our cool merch over on the store tab of the channel. But... Let's turn to this mysterious esoteric circle of the unique cherub and the foundations for the type of emanationism that will give rise to the spherot and in many ways to a foundational concept in all of Western esotericism. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.
For those with basically any experience of Western esotericism, this image, or something like it, will be immediately recognizable, even if it's not very deeply understood. It's one array of the divine emanations of the Sfirot that eventually emerged out of the medieval Jewish mysticism that is now known to all of us as Kabbalah. Although, again, not all Jewish mysticism is Kabbalah. There are lots of forms of mysticism that predate it. Specifically from the traditions originating primarily in a book called the Sefer Bahir, and then greatly expanded by the circle that composed the text, the Sefer Zohar, the Book of Radiance, before being systematized, as much as it was systematized in the 16th century by the followers of Rabbi Itzhak Luria. Of course, this array is a completely idealized exemplar for a system precisely defined by internal dynamism and complex, tensive, and torsive relationships. It's a map, and it's definitely not the territory, as anyone having read the Zohar or traditional Kabbalah for basically more than a few minutes can testify. But there are at least two questions here that should stand out immediately about this system. Well, two for this episode. There are a bunch of questions about this. But the two, at least for this episode, are where did this come from? The Bible never obviously mentions any of this, and the Genesis creation story seems to be in a creation account. Creation account, not an emanation account. And if you think this, you'd be in fantastic company with a host of traditional Jewish theologians, most notably that of the great eagle himself, Maimonides, who argued that the system is one of creation ex nihil and everything else is basically heresy. So you be with Maimonides on this, and he's kind of the second Moses of Judaism, or the worst heretic in the history of Judaism, if you, if you ask some people. Maimonides is polarizing like this. So, yeah, where did this system of emanations come from? And then two, Judaism is a religion of hyper-monotheism. Hashem is Echad. God is one. The core creed of Judaism states and is stated in multiple daily prayers. I mean, it's even the final mantra that one utters before one's death. So what gives? If God is Echad, if God is one, what is going on with this business of the ten Sfirot? If you're wondering this, you'd also be in good company. The medieval Jewish scholar Itzhak ben Sheshet argued that uh, the Kabbalah was worse than Christianity. That the Christians had just made God three. The Kabbalists had made God ten. Chas v'shalem. So, while this image and the theology of the Sephirot have become common, at least in esoteric circles outside of Judaism, and frankly they've just become the theology of most of Judaism, how all of this Sephirot business emerged, and how emanationism emerged, and how it's compatible with monotheism at all, are perfectly rational questions. Well, the answer to that, to be blunt, is that we don't exactly understand much about the origins of the Sefirot. They remain pretty mysterious after a century of research. Even what the word Sefirot originally meant, it first appears in the equally mysterious Sefer Yetzirah, isn't clear. In fact, that they were supposed to be ten Sefirot was actually up for grabs early on. The Iyun Circle, a group of proto kabbalists operating primarily in France, actually posited there were 13 such emanations, or Sfirot, which to my mind actually makes more sense when you think about the traditional attributions of the divine nature in Judaism. Though, again, the Sefer Yetzirah really does insist, insists, that there are 10 and not 9, 10 and not 11, so that one out. But to try to peel back some of the very esoteric history to get at the foundations of the kinds of emanations that would eventually become the Sfirot, we're going to have to leave Europe, where the Kabbalah really developed, and then wind back the clock a few centuries. What we'll find is a slow transition for philosophical, mystical, and theological reasons in the direction of emanationism. But before we arrive at the Sphero, we're going to find an entirely different system of mystical emanations. One centered on the divine pleroma, or the divine realm populated by various kinds of beings or divine hypostases, especially the angel of the divine glory, the kavod, 
mysteriously known as Achtriel, probably one of the most powerful and yet now completely extinct angels in religious history. Now, Judaism has had a long paradoxical relationship with the utter sovereign transcendence and the unity of the divine with the apparent reality of naked anthropomorphisms and divine theophanies or divine appearances in the Hebrew Bible. In effect, Judaism kind of wants to have it two ways. The divine is both utterly transcendent and yet completely imminent, which from at least a strictly philosophical point of view is pretty hard to maintain without some degree of logical contradiction. That might not bother you, but it certainly bothers theologians. Even the greatest prophet of all, Moses, is caught in this literary trap. The divine maintaining that no one can see the divine and live, allowing Moses only to get a glimpse of the divine back, hidden in a cave, basically. And yet the text also contends that Moses did, in fact, see the divine face to face. The theological tension is apparent in Israelite literature, and some early solutions to it do begin to appear in the radical apocalyptic tradition, and the chariot or Merkava mysticism. Here, a kind of semi-divine angel, usually Metatron, is said to act as the visible, comprehensible actor for the divine in our realm, at least. In fact, in some of the texts of this tradition, Enoch is actually transformed into Metatron, who is then shockingly referred to as Yahweh Katan, the lesser Yahweh. This, of course, set the stage for a lot of heterodox interpretations of this position, and it led to a position that we now know as bitheism, also known as the two powers in heaven heresy. This is famously, most infamously captured when Elisha bin Abuya, an early Merkava mystic, successfully descends into the divine throne room, only to witness the angel Metatron sitting on the divine throne. There's not supposed to be any sitting in there. Elisha then apostatized and or mutilated the shoots, as the Talmud has it, declaring that there are two authorities or two divinities in heaven. This causes his damnation and an event known as the humbling of Metatron, where that angel is flailed with 60 fiery lashes, sometimes by the angel Gabriel. Those fiery lashes, by the way, are pulse de nura in Aramaic, still kind of function as a I don't know, contemporary death curse in Kabbalistic thinking, although it's not exactly a death curse. Further, the rabbi has also introduced that a specific divine eminence interacted with Israel and dwelled in the Mishkan or Tabernacle and eventually in the Beis Mikdash in the temple, hovering between the Kerovim, the Cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, before finally and slowly retreating following the destruction of the temple, that divine eminence of the Shekhinah then goes into exile with Israel. Now, this Shekhinah wasn't yet a distinct emanation of the divine. The Talmud never uses language like that, nor is it the feminine aspect of the divine that will ultimately emerge in the Kabbalah over there in Spain as the Sphira Malchut. Those developments are centuries prior to the narratives of the Talmud. But, Already we can see that the eminence transcendence paradox is present in Israelite literature and that some solutions are evident in rabbinical literature, but would come with profound theological perils, especially the peril of bitheism or the two powers in heaven heresy. That becomes all the more of a problem with the rise of Christianity and its emergent Trinitarian theology. Bitheism? I'll raise you tritheism. The rabbinical establishment certainly didn't want anything to be associated with that, though I do strongly suspect that this apocalyptic matrix of ascent mysticism, bitheism, and transformation into angel-like beings actually lies at the theological foundations of Christianity as much as it did ancient mystical Judaism. In fact, I've explored this topic a little bit in some topics around Paul and Merkava literature. You can check that out on the card above. But the problem didn't go away. Theological and philosophical problems tend not to go away. It's good for job security. And so another solution began to appear first in the great, really the first great Jewish philosopher, the Sadia Gaon. Perhaps in the interest of reserving divine transcendence, 
Aramaic translations of the Torah known as the Targum literature in a generation just before the Saudi Agon had begun to replace specific references to the divine name yod heh vav heh with a more oblique reference to the divine glory, the divine kavod. Now this is just part of a long tradition of taboo replacement in Judaism in which the divine and the divine name are avoided in both writing and speech, a tradition that goes all the way down to this day. Thus, in some of these Aramaic translations, the divine name yod heh vav heh was sometimes subbed out for the divine glory, the kavod. This glory, or the kavod, becomes a kind of stand-in for yod heh vav heh such that yod heh vav heh becomes textually and orally remote, orally as in hearing it. Recall that Aramaic was the common language for people in this region at this time, and thus this is the kind of language that would have been the vernacular for reading of the Torah. But at the same time, the kavod, or glory of Hashem, became textually and orally imminent. That's what they were hearing. This translation veneration would be taken up into the philosophy by the Saudi Agaon in his famed book of Beliefs and Opinions, the first great work of Jewish philosophy. He would argue that the various anthropomorphisms, the various times that God has a, I don't know, an arm or something, but especially the vision of the divine seen by the prophets, like Elijah or Amos or Isaiah, they could simply not be the divine simplicator, given the fact of divine transcendence. You, you can't see God. God doesn't have eyes or a hand. But what the Saudi Gawain doesn't do, which Ibn Rushd would do a little bit later on, is make all of that material in the Hebrew Bible into metaphors. Why not make it into metaphors? Because that's a slippery slope for everything about God, including God, God's self, from all just becoming one elaborate metaphor. No, the Saudi Gawain does something shocking. He argues that the prophets did see someone and that the anthropomorphisms of the Bible are literally true but not of God simplicator, but of a specific created angel that acts as the representative of the divine in our realm, something like the angel of the Lord of Israelite literature. This angel of the presence, sometimes called the Sarpanim, the angel of the face, is a bit like a representative, perhaps an extension of the divine in the realm of eminence. Now, while a rather simple answer, which is good in philosophy typically, if not a very strange answer theologically, the problem was about to get a bit worse. As you probably know, the central threat to rabbinical Judaism at the time of the Saudi Agawan really wasn't Islam or Christianity, but a Jewish fraction that rejected the oral traditions of the rabbis known as the Karaites. Of course, the Karaites, despite their insistence of following Torah alone Judaism, they were a bit like Protestants in this way, like Jewish Protestants. They would eventually develop their own oral traditions, which survive all the way down into this day. Still, lots of Karaites out there, and God bless them. But in this case, they were assaulting various texts ascribed to rabbinical sages and took aim at what is, what is without any doubt the most scandalous text ever created in Judaism, the Shi'or Koma which was allegedly composed by the Merkava mystics, rabbis Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael. Now, it's scandalous because it fixates, obsesses upon the literal body of God, given esoteric names to the various body parts and the stupendous measurements of the regions of God's body. God's uh, beard, for instance, is 11,500 parasangs long, or about 34,500 miles, or 55,200 kilometers. And his name, Hadark, or Shema, we don't know how to say these words. At any rate, the Saudi Agam thought that this text was probably not really composed by Akiva and Ishmael, but he thought that if he gave the Karaites an inch, well, they'd take a mile. They'd be like, well, what about all those other rabbinic teachings? Why aren't all those frauds? Well, so he kind of, I don't know, bit the bullet and extended his angel of the Lord thinking and let the possibility be that the tremendous being described by the Shirokoma was yet another, even higher angelic being than the first one he described, 
It was a kind of divine glory typically only reserved for perception by the angels and the various celestial intelligences alone. We weren't supposed to be able to see this being, with perhaps some of those mystics ascending even higher than the biblical prophets. You see what he did there? He made the mystical rabbis even better than the prophets. The prophets had just seen this angel, but the Merkava mystics, they had seen this supernal kavod. It's a pretty clever trick. He kind of does one over on the Karaites. Thus, the Sadi Gaon had to posit at least two created angelic or quasi-angelic beings in his philosophy and theology as part of his polemics to link eminence and transcendence. And, uh, well, much to the horror of any Akamites out there, this opened the floodgates. A contemporary Talmudic commentator, Rabino Haniel, would eventually posit an infinite number of kavodim, or glories, that intervene between the remote and the divine manifest in our world of eminence. The High Gaon, the last of the great Gionim, would posit a version of this position, also maintaining that the prophets interacted with the created angel, which was in fact the kavod, or the glory of the divine. While other rabbis like Yehuda of Barcelona would reject that the kavod was an angel, because what does it mean to say that God's glory is an angel? Though he did contend that it was something higher than an angel, but he, he never explains exactly what that is. So he kicks that can right down the road. Following upon this speculation, and I think most importantly in all this, the scholar, astrologer, and commentator Ibn Ezra would continue this line of speculation, contending that the divine kavod had two faces. One which faced creation, the imminent one, and was actually beheld by the prophets, but also another hidden face turned toward the remoteness of divinity, the transcendence of divinity, somehow unified with that holy other holiness. The exact relationship of the kavod to the absolute interior divine is not really clear. Somehow it clings to the divine, davax to the divine, rendering it united and yet distinct from that remote transcendence. What will later become the typical language of emanation or azal isn't yet present in Ibn Ezra, but what is also missing at this point is the idea of the kavod being created. At this point, the kavod, angel or not, seems to come into existence as an extension or modality of the divine. And we're glimpsing the first moments in Jewish philosophical, mystical, theological history of something like a system of emanation with specific moments in that process. In this case, both to preserve the radical transcendence of the divine, but also to explain the experience of the divine by prophets and mystics. It seems like this kavod speculation, especially as taken up in the idea that the kavod was a kind of created angelic being, had actually become diffused through Jewish intellectual and mystical centers by around the 12th century. Yehuda ben Samuel of Regensburg was, you know, of course, of the famed Italian Colonimus family, then now had settled in Germany, but they brought with them an enormous tradition of esoteric Judaism. In fact, they had initiated an entire mystical and magical center there in Regensburg that is now known as the German Pietist or the Chaste Ashkenaz. Now, in a commentary to Ibn Ezra's commentary on the emanation of the divine glory, Rabbi Yehuda presses his thinking even further than Ibn Ezra. The manifest glory is, in fact, divine. It's an emanation of the divine, but it's also the proper recipient of the prayers of Israel. Now, this is no minor declaration. Prayer had, since the destruction of the temple, served as the primary mode by which Israel had communed with the divine. Rather than raising the smoke of incense or sacrifices, Israel now raised prayers. Further, worship of any kind was an especially tricky topic in Judaism because idolatry of any kind had to be carefully avoided because it was one of the most, if not the most, serious sin in Judaism. Thus, any mistaken worship could be taken as avodazara, or foreign worship, the worst sin, as I just mentioned. So why was the manifest divine kavod the proper target for the prayers of Israel? Precisely because the kavod was not created. It was emanated as an extension of the hidden divine, distinct 
but in no way separate. Any created being, even an angel created by God, could never be the target of prayer. That's just idolatry, full stop. But the emanated divine kavod serves this function wonderfully and allows for a literal reading of the Merkava mystics, the prophets, etc. However, an even more esoteric school would press this logic even further. In fact, this school was so esoteric that it wasn't even fully comprehended to exist separate from the German pietist, the Chashi Askenaz, until recent analysis in the past like 20 years has actually revealed that their literature doesn't line up with this previous idea. Now, we don't know the names of this group, basically. We don't know where they flourished. Maybe Germany, maybe France, maybe even England to some degree. How many of them there were, or even what happened to them. They seem to flicker into existence sometime in the late 12th century. They persist for three or four generations, and then they were probably just absorbed into the tidal wave that became the Kabbalah. But their writings are distinct for several reasons. The first is that they claim to be the inheritors of esoteric teachings going all the way back to the lineage of the prophet Jeremiah through his son Ben Sirah of the scandalous alphabet of Ben Sirah fame. That's another question why they would pitch their horse to this guy. His son Uziel, and specifically uh, via a Baraita, they attribute to Joseph Ben Uziel. The contents of this text, which further unify the school, the Baraita of Joseph Ben Uziel, along with a religious hymn or pew, typically which is attached to it or accompanies it, along with much of the literature of this esoteric circle, are actually profound and sustained commentaries on the Sefer Yetzirah. That seems to be the core text that unites this circle. Now, I've done a very long, deep dive on the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation. I say very long. I could do 50 different episodes on the Sefer Yetzirah and still not understand that thing any better. But if you want a bit of a deeper dive into the Sefer Yetzirah, check out the card above. But in brief, it's an enigmatic, brief text, which details the formation of the cosmos through the use of the Hebrew language. It's also worth pointing out that while the first few generations of analysis of the Sefer Yetzirah read it as a kind of quasi-scientific account of the creation of the Olam, of the cosmos, the text by the 12th century was increasingly becoming associated with esoteric magical practices, specifically the creation of golems, artificial humanoids, though in the time of they also created a golem calf, so that's interesting. Finally, the most distinctive feature of this circle is also how they've come to be known to history. We don't know what they called themselves, if anything. It was the centrality of a special angel, the Hakaruv Hamiyuchad, the unique or special angel or cherub that is what makes their mystical theology so fascinating. For this circle, the creation and structure of the Olam, or cosmos, was one of the utmost importance despite numerous rabbinical prohibitions on discussing just that topic. In fact, the Talmud even argues that it's best to have never been even born than to speculate on topics like where the world came from. Hence why they are probably just so esoteric and nothing is known about them. This wasn't exactly a good look. But their central guide was the Sefer Yetzirah, which for that community seems to have served as a kind of second occult genesis account where they are especially interested in the emanation of what we might now call the divine pleroma or the realm of the divine prior to the creation of our world or the emanation of our realm. Further, they're also interested in the practical uptick of these mystical speculations in the lived practice of Judaism, especially that central practice of prayer. Now, for this circle, as much as we understand them, Elohim represents the furthermost removed divine transcendence, the Deus Absconditus, which undergoes a twinning, to use their language, in which the element of Elohim becomes apparent as Yahweh. This kavod, however, unlike other schools we've discussed, remains totally hidden away as Elohim, or the kavod nistar, the hidden kavod. This hidden kavod remains in the primordial realm beyond all contemplation or understanding. 
but in this process of twinning, an aspect of the divine emanates, it emerges from that primordial fire, which is distinct from the fire which eventually goes on to produce the angels. Now exactly how or why this happened isn't exactly clear, and even more remote emanations actually might have occurred as well. The exact ontological relationship, for instance, between the divine presence or the kavod or the shekhinah and the glory isn't clear. Sometimes it's the glory and the shekhinah are the same, but what seems to emerge is a distinct being utterly unlike any other being in creation. Somewhat divine and yet not divine, angelic and yet hyperangelic. Hence the term for this being, the Keruv HaMayuchad, the special or the unique cherub. The Keruv HaMayuchad is formed like a candle which is used to light another candle, composed out of the same divine fire, but with a fire that burns such that it can be seen, unlike the hidden flame of the Kavod Nistar of Elohim, the hidden glory of Elohim. This angel, which many texts do identify with yod heh vav -Heh, is the being seen by the prophets and for which the anthropomorphisms of the Bible and the Shior Koma is true. This is the only entity we ever behold. We even learn the name of the unique cherub, Achathriel, a reference to a Talmudic story where that angel, Achathriel Ya Adonai Tzavaot, was seen to have appeared in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. So, in this way, the Karov HaMeyuchad might be seen as the most powerful and yet most esoteric angel in all of Western esotericism. I imagine most people have never even heard of these legends. However, this circle is emphatic that the Karov HaMeyuchad is divine, the object of prophetic visions, but it is absolutely not the target of prayers. Rather, prayer should only be rendered to Elohim, to the Kavod Nistar, the hidden glory detailed in the Sefer Yetzirah, as beyond all visual reality, but yet somehow accessible through speech and oral communication. That still, small voice at the very limits of being and non-being. However, along with the emanation of the Shekhinah, or the Divine Presence, might be prior or the same as the unique cherub. There isn't clear the relationship of them. Other entities are also said to come into existence within the divine pleroma, including the divine kingship or malchut or the throne of the divine, the holiness of the divine. Also, there are various types of fire or chashmal and various degrees of hiddenness and manifestation of these various kinds of fire along with the angels which are created from this fire along with, as I mentioned, the Kedusha and the Gadola, the holiness and the power, the dominion of the divine, all appear as entities which come to exist through emanation within the world of the divine pleroma, according to this circle. In general, a great deal of the speculation of this circle is to harmonize the biblical accounts of creation, the visions of the prophets, especially Ezekiel and Isaiah, the rabbinical literature, like the Talmud that they've inherited, all together, and most importantly, I would argue, with the Sefer Yetzirah as a kind of key that unlocks them all. They clearly took that to be the definitive account of both the inner evolution of the divine, but also the very process by which the Olam, or the cosmos, came into being. In all, between nine to twelve distinct texts of this school have come down to us, ranging from a single paragraph or a quotation down to long works mostly centered on exegesis of the Sefer Yetzirah, many of which show several generations of accretion and redaction as they were worked and reworked with several further entire commentaries by the same circle. And no, I don't think any of this literature has been translated in its entirety to English yet. In fact, I don't even think there's complete Hebrew editions of most of this literature. So some of these works were absorbed into the collections of the German pietists, that's why they're associated with them early on in the scholarship, and then eventually early Kabbalistic schools, wherein the special cherub is sometimes referred to as one of the Sfirot, though the texts don't say which one. There's some indication of an identification of the unique cherub with the Kabbalistic idea of the Ilat Ha'elot, 
the traditional Hebrew translation for Aristotle's unmoved mover, and eventually the Sphira of Keter, but the link isn't precisely clear. But if it is that link to the Ilat HaElot, that does make some sense that the unique cherub would be Keter. In other places, the being is linked to the Sarhapanim, the angel of the countenance, in other places vaguely to Metatron, and even to the sublime unity of Tiferet. The object not of the Shema prayer, but of the Barhu, which is the Jewish call to prayer, thus preserving the unique cherub, but also removing the worry about them becoming the target of prayer. They're the angel of the call to prayer, not prayer itself. Thus, in some sense, the unique cherub and the other emanations speculated about by this mysterious circle survived in at least half-life through the development of the Kabbalah as we know it. The unique cherub circle, though we're just now beginning to understand them, seems to have played a central, maybe even decisive role in the development of medieval Jewish divine Pleroma thinking, with their ideas finding eventually publicity in the writings of people like Rabbi Elchanan ben Yakar of London. And yet, there's very little evidence that they knew about or were known about by any other of the mystical circles during the period of their greatest activity, of which we know of about six of these different esoteric circles that were developing what we might call Proto-Kabbalah in Europe, including the folks over in Girona, Castile, Provence, the Iyun Circle, and other groups working on this material. This despite the fact that they had all inherited basically the same mystical, philosophical problematic how to wrestle with the paradox of divine immanence and transcendence, specifically by turning toward an emanationist metaphysics employing something like angels or quasi-angelic beings to bridge that gap. In fact, they nearly esotericated themselves. Esotericated. I can do that. This is my channel. They nearly esotericated themselves out of history. To this day, texts that still refer to their their literature as part of the Chassi Ashkenaz movement as the German pietist, but they were clearly theologically distinct from that group. But while the origins of the Sfirot do admittedly remain mysterious, and the nature of the unique cherub circle certainly remains more mysterious still, we can see in their speculations, in the little bit of writings that we have, the origin of the kind of emanationist metaphysics and pleromatic speculation, without which the famed Tree of Life the Sfirot, would have never come into existence as we know it. Without any doubt, your guy for the unique cherub circle is the amazing scholar Joseph Dahm, and his second volume of his History of Jewish Mysticism does a fantastic job placing the unique cherub circle in their position in the world of Proto-Kabbalah. Along with that, he's written an entire 270-page monograph on the unique cherub circle, which is magisterial research, and I've just barely scratched the surface here, to be completely honest. However, and I should admit this, both the history of Jewish mysticism that he's written, and especially the monograph on the unique cherub circle are highly specialized, and they require a pretty solid foundation of Jewish history, Hebrew and Aramaic, and even the general lay of the land of rabbinic and Kabbalistic history and literature just to kind of work in these texts. And again, this is especially true of his monograph. It's absolutely not an introductory text, and it's published by Moore Seebeck, which it's like the German Brill, but for more like Bible stuff. So expect Brill-like prices for it. That said, it's a fascinating topic, the unique cherub circle and the history of the Kabbalah and the history of Western esotericism, frankly, and it's well worth your time to make your way up to studying it. More Kabbalah to come. Until next time, thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.